Welcome, everyone. Thank you for coming. All right, my name is Tim Rayburn. I work for a company named Improving. You're going to hear a good bit about it, so I'm not going to belabor my company because we're here today to talk about helping your teams avoid apathy and burnout. Um, I think this has become a very real, very massive problem for technology teams in particular, I find. And it's probably seven tenths at least of friends in my network going, why am I leaving? Because of this, right? Why am I leaving the job I'm at? Um, really quickly about me, uh, this, is, this is my, which version of, oh, this is my com nerd's nerd. I'm in a suit, so this is good. All right, uh, so yes, I'm wearing a suit. Yes, I'm also a developer by background. I'm a Microsoft MVP for 11 times between 07 and 2018. Um, I've been doing this thing for, for 25 years. Um, I love smoked meats and barbecue, like hugely. If you're interested in barbecue, come talk with me. I am also a level one Magic the Gathering judge. I'm a former D&D podcaster. Yes, this is, yeah, thank you. <laughs> so, so, yeah, I, I, I come by my nerd honestly. So, I work for a company named Improving that I joined in 2009. They had existed since approximately late uh, 2006. So I come in very early in their long journey. I join as employee 40-ish, okay? Um, and it's a small boutique consulting firm in Dallas when I join. And I'm joining because of the fact that I had previously worked for a much larger consultancy who I was sick and tired of the fact that they didn't, uh, wouldn't, were not willing to even give voice to there are better ways to manage projects and manage software development than whatever the client was already familiar with. And I understand in consulting, what the client is familiar with will always have a heavy weight. It's the process they're familiar with, things like that. But I feel the job of the consultant is to come in and consult, right? Not just be an individual contributor, be additive to the process, bring your experience in. And so if you were to join Improving today in 2024, you would be somewhere around employee 1500. We're now in three countries. We have 15 offices. And so it's been a wild ride, okay, to, to watch a company grow through that. And let me tell you the number one thing that all of my friends who are like, oh, your company is growing that much, I'm so sorry, right? Why? Because it won't be the same company, right? And the truth is, you're going to change as you scale. But if you lose who you are along the way, then it all burns out. So, as I mentioned, 15 offices. But we've, we've managed to scale while keeping a consistent habit of winning Best Places to Work awards. I do not need to make my sales call this morning. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, teams, for, for that interruption. Um, so we, we in the Dallas office are now up to something like 11-time winner of the Dallas Best Places to Work award, okay? So we've been at this for a while, and we've managed to keep who we are along the journey. Okay. So this is one of my favorite Grace Hopper quotes. Grace is amazing. Um, if you have never heard how you explain uh, satellite communications uh, using a spool of wire, care of Grace Hopper, you should go look up Grace Hopper spool of wire satellite communications. Trust me, worth your time. The, this, this quote actually appears on my business cards. And why does it appear on my business cards? Because of the fact that we need to remember that every one we interact with, not everything we interact with, but every one we interact with is a human being who has feelings and desires and goals. And as such, you need to lead you need to not just try to manage. And the world of, oh, well, we have management systems to handle that. It's like, yeah, but systems don't 
always deal with what they need to deal with. And this is all relevant to our topic today because of the fact that if you go look up the top nine, I believe this is, reasons why people uh, feel burnout and apathy at a job, you get this list. No, this is not ChatGPT generated, just for the record. Um, though I'm sure ChatGPT would come up with mostly the same list. So I looked at this list and I, I felt it was interesting to me because we're in a room full of technologists. Let me ask you this. Are hard problems fun? I think hard problems are fun, right? If hard problems are fun, why is challenging workloads leading this list, right? And what I, my read of this was challenging work is fun if you can actually get it done. And the problem is, is that everything else on that list is toxic work environment and toxic work culture. Lack of control, scarce rewards, toxic environment, unfair expectations. The entire rest of the list poisons the first one. And when you go and ask people, well, why are you quitting? Well, I mean, work too hard. Okay, it's a job, right? <laughs> there are going to be challenging things. But I'll give me the right team and we'll conquer Everest. Give me the wrong team, and I can't conquer the hill outside. And so that really led me to looking at what we had done along the way at improving and trying to go, all right, how did we get this right? And I'm going to tell you, most likely accidentally, right? But this piece wasn't accidental. This is the thing that culture doesn't just happen. Um, I'm going to ask for a moment of honesty. How many people here actually manage someone else? In the, in the, all right, fantastic. Okay, so the, I, I really want, in particular the managers to hear this, though, everybody, take this to heart. Culture doesn't just happen. It has to be worked at. You have to think about it. You actually have to work. And I'm here to tell you this. This is my most often quoted quote out of this presentation, which I've given several times now. Your culture is defined by the worst behavior you're willing to accept. Think about your work environment. Think about what goes on on a regular basis there. And what is that thing that's, that collectively the organization is like, Okay, right? And they keep doing that. Okay, not worth the fight right now. It's like, it's not worth the fight. It is defining the floor of your culture. And the floor of your culture is the only version of your culture that matters. Okay? So I have a whole different talk um, that I give. I mentioned I'm a barbecue nut about uh, everything I needed to know about consulting and business I learned from barbecue. And uh, the short version of that talk is, it is variance, not excellence, that matters, okay? When you go and do a thing, I don't care how high you peak. I care how tightly you constrain your lows and your highs. It is that variance between low and high that actually matters, which for our purposes here in the culture discussion, this quote defines. This quote defines what is that low? What is that thing you are, unwill you are willing to accept and just go, okay, that's it, right? Because now you've hit your floor. You've found your floor. And the problem with this, as any, all the managers are screaming at me in their head right now, is, but I'm not dealing with that for a reason. Yep. Yep you're going to have to buckle on the bravery pants and go accept the challenge that addressing those things that are defining your floor of your culture are. So 
When I talk with people inside my company, 90% of the conversations I have are about culture. Now, you're going to go like, no, that can't possibly be true. And my response is, it is, except for the fact that you're just not thinking about it. Every conversation about a pay raise is actually a conversation about culture. Every conversation about whether or not to do a particular event or to address a grievance and so on and so forth is actually about culture. The, this is something that a lot of people miss. The, if you've ever thought to yourself, well, this isn't about you. This is about the policy. Ding. As a matter of fact, probably ding. <laughs> okay. Um, we need to recognize that we are all a part, actively a part of this. Right? Now, that, me that works both ways. If you don't lead teams, it means that how you treat every other person you work with every single day, this is also true for you. And you are defining that. And if you have had a remarkably crappy morning where you fought with your spouse, and your kids got to school late, and you're just frustrated to all heck, and you have that meeting that you didn't really want to take to begin with, that started at 10 and is now the first meeting of your day because you're just getting into the office, I'm here to tell you, push that meeting off. Go take the time you need to recenter yourself because if you walk in fully loaded to emotional bear, you are doing nobody any good, right? Because you are working against this culture of you owe it to everyone around you to do your best and to work on culture every single day. Now, here's the thing. Culture isn't, culture isn't magic. You can work all you want. You can scatter seed to plant good culture constantly. And if it's not based on and finding root in an environment that has values defined for it, you are going to best case, wind up with nothing, okay? Worst case, wind up with a jungle, okay, of mismatched stuff overgrowing one another, which nobody can get through. You have to have some sort of definition for this. And so that puts the challenge, because uh, I'll give another truth to those who lead here, I'll out the, the managerial cards. Values scare managers and leaders. They mostly scare managers. They really, they, they don't scare leaders as much. But it is this concept of external accountability. Values are the thing that you can look at a management group and go, but you're not living into that thing you said you wanted to live into, right? So, Opening your mouth and stating them, super scary. Because not, most people don't like accountability. Now, it can't just be painted on your walls, was the, the comment here, right? These are literally improving values. They are literally pictures of us having painted it on the walls. Yes, our marketing group does this too, okay? The, you have to walk the walk. Now, these are, these are arts. We talk about dedication and excellence and involvement. I am not saying these are magic hooks. I've lived my life, worked 15 years for the last, the last uh, 15, my last 15 years have been working for this same company. So I'm here to tell you that I don't know your environment. What I can tell you is that this works. This concept of having something some set of values. So we, la we ask all of our consultants to live into dedication, excellence, and involvement, right? And we do that because we think these things make a difference. And when a manager undermines someone's ability to deliver with excellence, to be dedicated to their, uh, to their customers, etc., we have a problem. This, though, 
is the least impactful side of values to our culture. This is the one prob probably 50% of companies have publicly stated values of some sort like this. On the other hand, how many people work for a company where the leadership of the company has a set of commitments they have publicly made to their employees? Said, said, put out there and gone, these are the things you can expect of leadership inside this company. A handful, fantastic. Way more rare than it should be, okay? This, these are our five commitments that we make to every improver, the name for folks who work for improving. And it starts with, we wanna cultivate an environment that fosters long-term personal and professional relationships. Goes on to say that we want to share in, let everyone share in the accomplishments of the company. We want to promote open and honest communication. We want to provide creative ways to learn and grow. And we want to encourage an atmosphere that is both friendly and fun, okay? And putting these out there, some of my best meetings ever have been wonderfully vague meetings put on my, uh, on my calendar by someone who works for me, where they come in and go, so I don't think that you lived really well into promoting open and honest communication here, right? I, I, I will give a very concrete example, but never done this one publicly. I very recently had a situation where I responded to someone who was being fairly critical of the company's position on something on the public, on our public channel inside the company, the top of our Slack team, so in our general chat. Okay, so, and they were, they were calling out something that had happened at the global town hall, which our CEO had led the night before and was reopening that topic of conversation. And I was, the, uh, the, the details underneath it was I definitely felt personally attacked by part of what was going on. And so I came back with a response that was very pointed. It was not an attack, but it was pointed, okay, back at that person. And it had been on the, on the public chat for about 10 minutes when another VP out of our Ohio enterprise came and went, Yo, Tim, like, have you actually read what you wrote? I went, yeah, I read it. No, go back and read what you wrote. So I read it, and I'm like, I was a little pointed there. Yup, that's it. That was all I needed, right? Go back to the general chat and put in there I do, what I don't do. I don't edit my previous response. Been up for 10 minutes, right? But I was like, no, no, no. I, I do not live in the land of edit, edit chat, okay? I come back and I go, apologies. That was more pointed than I wanted it to come off. I've reached out to the person individually to have a conversation. We're gonna be talking later today. We'll update here when, when we're done. But it was just a acknowledge I had done wrong, right? Acknowledge that. I had done it. Now, if it had been any other consultant inside the company, maybe the response that I gave would have been a, sl a more minor transgression of what culture was. But what my fellow VP was rightly nudging me and reminding me is that the stupid title has power. Okay. I for the record, have been with the company for 15 years, regularly still sweep the floors, so to speak, right? I, the title exists because of the fact that it enables me to do things. And it was one of those moments where I'm like, yeah, me saying that carried more weight because I'm a VP, right? And I had to go back and go, mm, I need to go walk that back. That was just one example of getting properly called out on this. Very few companies define this. And if your company doesn't, you should ask them to think about it. Because really at the end of the day, 
if you have a set of, of values that your company is about, right, how does that not create expectations for leadership? right? Values that are just about every one of you should do this thing every single day. It's a really good way to get preachy, right? And it's not a really good way to be accountable or to be able to be corrected. And that is hugely important to to keeping a company culture that can change and just doesn't become stagnant. Um, The, I have side jaunt here. I'm a consultant. We do software development and IT. So I have been preaching Scrum and Agile for 15 years as a way to look at, as a better way of handling projects. And regularly, I have people going, there's all those meetings where I have to talk with people. Can't we cut cut, cut out a bunch of this stuff? And anybody know what the first meeting they always want to cut out of Scrum is? Uh, no, it's actually, shockingly, it's retrospectives, right? And then it's stand-up, okay? And it's because retrospectives scare them, and, that, and stand-ups happen too often. And, the, and I'm like, you, you, every time somebody comes at me with, I want to cut retrospectives, I'm like, you can't cut retrospectives. It is literally the only piece of Agile that you keep. If you took only one piece, piece, take the retrospective, you will wind up with the correct version of everything else. As long as you meet regularly, talk about being willing to change, and then actually go implement some change. It has to start with the retrospective. It is the single most important piece, right? These commitments are that. These are commitments are an open willingness to say, when I wander off of the path of this, come and call me on it. Hold me accountable to it. All right. And then you need to actually have a plan. Okay. Uh, the, I think that this book, Passionate Performance, is 64 pages big. Um, and every time I bring this up, I, my, my joke is, like, this guy clearly didn't have an editor to tell him to fluff out the other 400 pages of content that this 64-page pamphlet needed, okay, to become like the defining business book of our time. Instead, it's 64 pages of this. It is, here is how people think and engage with work and how you can work that as a system. So the first thing that passionate performance talks about is that you have to be able to engage the minds of your employees. You have to be able to show them that inside your organization, you can achieve, you have autonomy to do the work you need to do, and that you are allowed to grow the mastery of your skills inside this organization. I think everybody here, if I told you you had to go find a job right now, would be like, yeah, that's what I'm looking for right? That's the, that's the space. And what, what Mr. Colin will tell you is, yes, but you're totally missing the point, which is you also have to engage hearts. You have to engage the emotional side of the human beings that you are interacting with. You can manage AIs and systems with the mind side but we are emotional creatures and you have to involve both sides, which means that you have to let your employees feel alignment with your purpose, to feel appreciated, and to feel like they have that intimacy and connection with you and others inside the company. And so when you can manage to hit that perfect point where you're engaging all of this, That's when you get the best performance. That's when you get passionate performance. If you're just, you're working on cool tech and able to go do your thing and be able to advance your career, but I'm doing it for Dr. Evil, who never meets with me and who 
never appreciates a single thing that I do, even though my salary goes up every single year, right? Um, you're there, Dr. Evil's not getting the best work out of you at that point. So how then do we take this and go, all right, I want to use this lens, this rubric to look at every single thing that we do inside the company every single time we interact with one another. And I want to say, how is this moving things forward? And so we literally have flipped this onto its head and gone, here's how, let's just score ourselves. Let's turn that into a scorecard, Whoop. okay? Because everybody likes a good scorecard, right? Let's look at any given activity and say, how, do, how does this score? So how does movie night score? This is you know, something that Improving does from time to time. We will go rent out a big theater, invite all of our employees and prospective clients and others to come in and, and do a thing, right? And it's just, we're all there to watch Avengers or Top Gun 2 or whatever you want to name as the latest hot movie. Well, sorry to say that you know, it doesn't rate very well from an achievement perspective. It doesn't rate very well. Well, it rates medium to high on autonomy because it's completely optional, right? The moment it's completely optional, you lose even that link to doing well on the mind. If I make it a requirement that you be there, right? Now we're walking off a different way. Mastery, there is nothing about me as a software developer, somebody else as a as an agile coach or a platform engineer that's going to get anything that helps the mastery of their craft out of watching Avengers. You know, we don't employ any fighter jets, so even Top Gun 2 doesn't help, okay? So on the flip side, it does help with intimacy. It can help with appreciation. Probably doesn't help very much with purpose, but it's at least got that going for it. It's an attempt at an emotional side of things. And so we started taking this and saying, how do we look at every single thing? Our 11 years ago, 12 years ago, now 12 years ago, um, our CEO launched a new program where he was like, I want to take and start working on leadership development for the company because I think we're going to grow. And if we're gonna grow, we're gonna need more leaders. And I want those leaders to come from inside the company rather than outside the company. And all of my folks are consultants, so their day job is filled with solving problems for other companies and not understanding how we solve things internally. So let's fix that gap. That's, that was his problem statement. And he created this integral business program or business practices program here. And his first choice was, I want to make sure that it's a big deal to get in. So we're gonna teach it to five people. I want to make sure that the way that class is structured is such that the student who has a full-time other job, and this is an intensive multi-week course, has the autonomy to decide how they're going to take on all the tasks that we're gonna ask them to do. So it's a complete checklist driven thing and you're checked one time at the end of the program. If you think you can get all 13 weeks done in, la in the 13th week, do it. You can't by the way, but sure, give it a try, okay? Mastery, this is the, uh, this is the false low, right? Which is, the reality is, is being, uh, learning how our company sells, how our company writes contracts, how our company does all of these things has nothing to do with being a software developer. But it does have a great deal to do with being a leader inside our organization. So it's low mastery to your day-to-day -day job now, but it is everything about mastery to grow you into something more than you are. And on the flip side, the entire course is about, here's the purpose for why we're in business. He taught it personally for five years. After five years of teaching it, he opened it up to be taught by two other 
two presidents inside our organization of eight at the time. And only two of them could teach it. And so very high intimacy, very high investment in the connection with, uh, with the students, right? And then when it's all said and done, a whole bunch of public acknowledgement and appreciation around the graduates of it. Carefully and deliberately crafting a program meant to score high over and over and over again, looking at this rubric for how we engage with people and making sure it does well. There are tons of potential examples here. This is one of them. It scored super high. I think I have one where it's like we have the maybe less, less good. Here are our monthly social events, right? Again, low mastery, low achievement. So this is not about everything has to be high all the time, right? This is about balancing things and looking at them in total, taking a step back and going, you know, we never do anything that helps people grow their technical skills, right? We never do anything there. If we're doing nothing there, how can we expect people to stay engaged? This is an industry that reinvents itself literally daily. I am fairly certain there have been three new JavaScript frameworks released while I have been giving this talk. <laughs> that joke never gets old. Uh, so how then, do we, how then do we make sure that we're looking at this consistently? And it's about trying to be aware and to have a plan, right? To, to use this or something like this to go, I want to have a plan for making sure that I don't have a blind spot, okay? Because you really should take a step back on these and go, you know, we keep doing that event, and I know it's Bob's favorite event, and Bob's the head of the social committee, so we do it every year, but it kind of doesn't work, right? And maybe this year we try something new, right? Looking at those blind spots. So, Mike, this is the, the structure, this is my thought that I place to you. It is all about helping your teams avoid apathy and burnout. It's all about deliberately crafting a plan to engage them that is focused on your company's values and that doesn't ignore the realities and in particular the floor of your culture. With that, I'd love any questions anyone has on this topic. Hi, thank you for your talk. Mm -hmm. um, I need to preface this by saying I, my team does embody a lot of the wonderful culture first qualities that you talked about. Mm -hmm. And I'm not just saying that because my manager is sitting next to me. <laughs> <laughs> um, but my question for you is, do you think it's possible to turn around a more negative team culture into a positive one? And if so, how? Uh, so, is it possible? Ooh, maybe. Okay. Um, the, the, the answer is it really depends on, on whether or not they're receptive to change at all, right? If they're not receptive to change, the answer is no, right? Um, I had a quote. I used it last night well, at the happy hour, right, which is if you can't change your environment, change your environment, right? The, 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 that's that's why the whole retrospective tangent, right? If you can't change where you are, then change where you are, okay? Because that's, that is, stagnancy is, it's interesting because of the fact that it's something that you have to, as a leader inside an organization, deliberately fight. Because all companies are machines built to keep doing the thing they have always done, right? And so being willing to say, hey, there's something that's evolving in the marketplace and there's something that's evolving culturally and we need to be aware of that and we need to integrate that into who we are now, right? That's something that doesn't come naturally to companies. And as a matter of fact, they have a natural friction to it, right? And good companies have put in place ways to conquer that friction, deliberately oil those friction points, right? And bad ones, you should leave. Any other questions? Actually, this is sort of a direct follow-up to that. Yeah. Uh, so let's assume that you want to be the oil for that friction. 
Yep. At what point do you feel like it's no longer worth it, right? Like the organizational inertia is too much and like you just need to get out versus like let's actually try to actively fix it despite the fact that like say the entire C-suite is like, you know what? I don't care about any of these values. Yeah. Um, I think that um, for me, there, there's no easy answer to what you're – for me, I can tell you that – if I believe in the, the people, I believe in the company, if I believe in the fact that we can get better, if we were to take some minor adjustments, I am very likely to flame out rather than freeze out, right? In, um, and that probably means to me that my last meeting at that company would be directly with the C-suite, get on their calendar and go, this right here, this is what's causing you pain. I realize it's down here and you can't see it, right? But this is it. You need to address this. And I've tried walking this up and I am getting pushback from the structure you have put in place. And I feel it's my job to accomplish and keep that well oiled. And so unless we can fix the structure above me to stop seizing me up, I'm going to leave. Right. And like have that conversation that directly pointing it out. Right. And not as a threat. I'm going to leave or unless you do this. But a I have tried and moved and and brought this up and I can document that I did so. Right. And it's not that Bob, the middle manager, is a jerk face. It's Bob is aligned the wrong way or doesn't see the value of this. Do you can we fix this? And if not, then now is the time, right? But for me, I would make sure that I'd be at the top before I'd be walking in that situation because most likely at the top, grand misnomer, most people at the top actually do want the good stuff to happen. It's just fallen out of their awareness, right? And so walking in with a, I would like to make you aware of something, right? And can we by bringing your awareness, then correct some stuff. Okay. Yeah. So I love that you're focusing on um, trying to push the culture up. Yeah. Right. Um, tough thing to do for sure. But I want to actually turn the other direction. We live in a world of constant reorgs, right? Yes. It's endemic to probably every industry, but yes. certainly our industry. Let's say you inherit as a leader a team with just the wrong culture, whatever that means for you, right? Everyone mm -hmm. has a different sense of that. Um, what are like? What's the playbook? How do you how do you go about building the culture you want? What are the most important touchstones there? I, I think it starts with going back to sharing your values, sharing your accountability commitments, both to those folks, and go this like. Hopefully, at that level we're beyond the three things painted on the wall thing. Like, don't go and have that conversation. Go, for you and your team, this is what I need and expect, and these are, the, like, the top bullet points, the OKRs, whatever it is. Like, this is what needs to happen, right? And this is how I am empowering you and enabling you to do that, right? And I'm, in particular, speaking to any team leadership, I'm going to be like, I care you and I are going to have challenging words anytime I incur, encounter a point where you're working against one of my OKRs for I don't care what else. Like, if you think there's a something else that's more important than that, then let's have that conversation. It's possible my OKRs are wrong or whatever they are, right? But, but these are the four I've defined for you, and let's have that conversation, right? And... Then listen, right? Because here's the thing, again, emotions, right? They've been hurt. They've been, they're uncertain. They're dealing with all of that, right? How do you appropriately make it like, these are the things I need, right? I'm seeing you working in set, why? Right, like, um, inside improving, we do a lot with, uh, the concept of trust, and we're big fans of Stephen M. R. Covey's Speed of Trust. Um, if you haven't read this book, strongly recommend you read this book. 
Here's why, if you've ever read about software patterns before, uh, uh, Covey's book is Software Patterns for Human Interaction, okay? It is not about the fact that there is a pattern, it's the fact that you have a shared vocabulary, right? To go, all right, I need to, I need to right or wrong here. I need to do it. I need to show loyalty here. I need to listen first here. I need to clarify expectations here. That, those words become, can, can become institutional if you share this around and go, this is a language that we can use to talk about these emotional things, right? So that everybody has an understanding. And I mean, in an ideal world, we'd all come out of an education system that has equipped us to be able to think and talk about these problems. But, oh, wait, we live in the United States, so here we are. Okay. So does that answer? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. As a company who is doing well at this, when you interview a new potential employee, what are the questions that you want to be asked so that you can show that employee that you're a great place to work? Yeah, um, they, I want to be asked how I'm going to help them grow, right? I want to be asked if you've ever had a fabricate, like companies fabricate uh, scenarios all sorts of times in, in interviews to put candidates on the spot and get them to talk about an uncomfortable time where they had conflict and things like that, right? I love it when the candidate flips the script and goes, you know, you've had a, you know, a young woman working for you who became pregnant and then her performance began to slip at the uh, client. How did you deal with that? Right? Put a f fictional scenario in and then go, how did you deal with that? Right? Because it's proving that you care not just about the fact that I have a pile of money to pay you, right, but that I have the skills necessary to actually help manage a team and help you grow and deal with the conflicts and the realities of being an emotional human being and a full human at work. So those would be the things that, that I really like when they, when they come up from a candidate. Other questions? A few more? Am I running out of time? Oh, well, we're up against lunch. Oh, okay. All right. We'll take these last two questions and then go, then we will free people for lunch. No. Okay. Questions? Hands? Hi. Um, I find this, uh, this presentation very, very informative and I'm, I'm excited to see the, some of the books that you had um, mentioned. Mm -hmm. um, what would you say, um, a newer employee could do to maybe, um, and admittedly introverted, um, how can they um, insert themselves more in the social situations at work? Because, um, or alternatively, how do you break up like clicks in the good culture so that the good culture can flow to people who aren't included um, mm -hmm. for whatever reason? Yeah, I, I think that, uh, that the best answer I have there is, first of all, uh, if you're in that introverted mindset, right, and you're trying to grow and make change, monitor, think, and watch your own motivation, right, and make sure that when you are ready to step in and go, all right, I'm going to go around on trying to make things better here, that you're charged up before you do, right? Okay, um, because your extrovert friends suck. No, I mean, they, they, I'm one of them, so I, I don't get to throw that stone. But your extrovert friends are always ready to go uh, and have that human interaction. And you can't outlast them, right? Because of the fact that the engagement is driving up their battery levels and down your battery levels, right? So come in with a plan. Um, the ones, the most successful introverts, the powering change that I've seen inside of our company, right, are use the power of one-on-ones, right? Go ask for the one-on-ones and talk with people who have the influence inside the organization to help. And number two, help with the thought leadership internally. 
take something like Covey's Speed of Trust and go, hey, I'm going to do a book study and conversation around this. And we're going to take 30 minutes every Wednesday during lunch and talk about you know, this section of the book and then work our way through it. Gives an environment to start spreading that idea where all it takes is action, right, from, from you. But you can keep it time boxed and, and corralled to the topic of the book to be able to help. Those are two ways I have seen it. I'd love, if you're interested, talk to me afterwards. I have a magic LinkedIn slide. If anybody wants to scan the code, that's how to connect with me on LinkedIn. Okay, um, the, if you want to connect afterwards, I'll put you in touch with people who are living that life a little bit more clearly than I am because I don't have all the answers because I am a shy extrovert um, in, on the, the scheme of things. So I can help with shy, bold problems, but introvert problems, less so, okay? One, right. last, One last question. All right, so when I first became a manager, one of the most important things to me was to challenge my own relationship to power mm -hmm. such that if I get feedback or get called out or so on to be held accountable, it has more of an impact on me coming from those who I manage than it would, say, a peer on the same level. Mm -hmm. So in the example that you shared, you said it was another VP that called you on the point yeah. of response. So what is your, your method or feedback loop in order to challenge that relationship to power where you're hearing it from below you and it having yeah. that kind of impact? Yeah, I, I certainly have examples that I could give where I've had heard it from those who were beneath me in the organization, so to speak, right? Um, and that I, that I am leading, be, leading the, that portion of the organization. And those examples exist. It w simply wasn't the one that I had on the, on the top of my list. And yes, it happened to be a peer in a cousin branch of the, of the organization. But I think that it is, I think the, my actual long-term answer there is start with making sure inside your organization that as you promote, you're looking for that appropriate relationship with quote unquote power, right? If someone wants a title because they want the title, they almost certainly shouldn't have it, right? Like the, the, the people I want to promote are the people who are, are already driving the change they want to see, right, inside the organization because they're out there and doing it and trying to make the change. And then, oh, by the way, we're going to wind up recognizing all that effort by giving them a title when it's all said and done. If they did all of that work just to get the little check mark, right, then once they get the check mark, it's going to fall off, right? And they're probably going to become abusive with the, with the title. Um, this is, I, I mentioned I was an 11 time Microsoft MVP. That program is fascinating because of the fact there are a bunch of people who, who go and seek and achieve that award, right? And then they're gone. They get it one year, maybe two, and then they're out. Because they didn't do it because they loved it. They did it because they, uh, they wanted that recognition, right? And I think that the real answer is be very, very careful about how you hand out titles and make people show you that they are doing a thing because they enjoy it, not because of the fact that they're seeking a title that they think comes out the backside of it. Does that help? A little bit?